Welcome to Prophecy Countdown with author and pastor Kenneth Baer. Join us every week for the latest updates on what the Bible has to say about the events, the characters, and prophetic signs of the return of Jesus Christ and His coming kingdom. Make sure you not only subscribe, but like your favorite episodes and share it with your friends. Now, on with the broadcast. Welcome to Prophecy Countdown. I'm Pastor Ken. And the title of my message today is number 421, Coins, Caesar, and the Christ. And we'll be looking at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Prophecy Countdown podcast is a ministry of faith dialogue, a faith-based ministry. And we would love to hear from you. Send us your comments, your questions, and any ideas you have for future prophecy updates. You can email us at prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. Our Sunday messages premiere at 1 p.m. and then our prophecy updates premiere on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Before we get into our message today, I want to remind you that my latest book, The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom, is now available on Audible. Get online and order your copy either in print, digital, or the audio version. You will certainly be blessed, at least I believe you will. So let's get today's topic, number 421, Coins, Caesar, and the Christ. Today's message is an event in Matthew uh, chapter 22, and the context is important. This is the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. The tension between him and the religious leaders is reaching its peak. The religious elite who are the prof- professionals and their uh, their profession, their livelihood, depend on the continuation of what we know as the status quo and the centrality and the significance of the temple in Jerusalem. And they have long felt threatened by the teachings of Jesus. His growing popularity and the undeniable authority from which he speaks is something they feel they have to take down and dismantle. Determined to discredit him, they resort to a series of attempts to trap Jesus in his own words. Matthew 22, 15 to 22 records one such instance when the Pharisees and the Herodians join forces to challenge Jesus on the issue of paying taxes. So I'll read these verses and then we'll unpack it. And again, the title of my message today is Coins, Caesar, and the Christ. We're starting at chapter in verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in their talk. And they sent to him their disciples and the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. You know, this encounter is remarkable for several reasons, not the least of which is this unusual alliance, this unlikely alliance between the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Pharisees were the strictest observers of the Jewish law. They were fiercely opposed to Roman rule or any form of collaboration with this pagan empire. The Herodians, on the other hand, were supporters of Herod's dynasty who was appointed by Rome, and by extension, cooperators with Rome. These two groups had very little in common except for their shared animosity towards Jesus. This passage today presents us with an important teaching on how we, as followers of Jesus Christ, can navigate the tension between our earthly obligations and our heavenly citizenships. We are actually citizens of two worlds, heaven and earth. This is not simply a teaching on the payment of taxes. Jesus' response to these challenges not only diffuses their trap, but also offers profound insights into our responsibilities 
as citizens of both this world and the kingdom of God. We have, as I said, joint citizenship. As the passage opens, the Pharisees and Herodians approach Jesus with a question that seems simple on the surface, right? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? However, this was no innocent inquiry. It was a well-planned trap designed to ensnare Jesus in his own words. The question was loaded with political and theological implications. If Jesus had answered yes, he would alienate his Jewish followers, who resented Roman taxation as a symbol of their subjugation. Many Jews viewed paying taxes to Caesar as an act of a blasphemy against the temple, a submission to a pagan ruler who claimed divine status. On the other hand, if Jesus had answered no, he could be accused of inciting rebellion against Rome, a crime that was actually punishable by death. The Pharisees and the Herodians, and remember, these were very unlikely allies, had come together for a common purpose to bring down Jesus. They shared disdain for him. Uh, their shared disdain for him outweighed their ideological differences and their, their common dislike of each other, and they hoped that they could force him into making a statement that would either discredit him or incriminate him. Their allegiance highlights the extreme lengths to which Jesus' opponents were and are willing still to silence him. Jesus is fully aware of their malice and their insincerity. Jesus does not fall into the trap. Instead, he responds with a cutting question of his own. He says, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the money. Jesus' favorite term for these religious leaders was hypocrites. Now think about that for a moment. The New Testament often portrays Roman centurions more favorably than the Jewish religious leaders. When Jesus asked them a question whose image and description is this, they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus then delivers his famous statement, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but to God the things that are God's. This coin used for purchasing everything from food to family homes, the denarius, was a tangible reminder of the ubiquitous power of Rome. By asking whose image was on the coin, Jesus highlights the reality the reality that the Jews, like everyone else in the empire, were operating within a system that was dominated by Rome. Now, on the surface, Jesus is stating the obvious. The coin bears the image of, of Caesar. Then it, that, thus, it belongs to Caesar. But his statement goes much deeper because he adds these words. But to God, the things that are God's. Jesus shifts the focus from a political question to a theological one. He acknowledges the legitimacy of earthly authorities like, like Caesar, like Rome, while simultaneously affirming the ultimate sovereignty of God. In essence, Jesus is teaching that, again, we live in two kingdoms, the earthly one and the heavenly, and we have obligations to both. Our, and while we have obligations to both, our ultimate allegiance belongs to God. Now, this does not mean that we disregard our responsibility to the earthly authorities. Rather, it means that we recognize the limitations of those earthly authorities. Caesar may have his image on the coins, but we bear the image of God. Our lives, therefore, belong to him. Jesus' teaching in this passage challenges us to think deeply about our dual citizenship. As Christians, we are citizens of heaven, yet we live in a world and we often must comply with earthly regulations, the demand of our earthly authorities, whether they be governments, employers, or institutions. So how do we navigate this tension? Jesus provides us with a framework for understanding our responsibilities. Jesus does not call his followers to rebel against our earthly authorities or simply for the sake of rebellion. Paul echoes this sentiment in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, a, a verse that's well known. He, he, Paul writes, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. 
So paying taxes, obeying laws, and respecting authorities are part of our responsibilities as citizens of this world. Even though the Roman Empire was often oppressive and unjust, it provided certain benefits such as the roads, security, social order. In the same way, modern governments, though far from perfect, provide essential services that contribute to the common good. By fulfilling our obligations, we contribute to the stability and the well-being of the society in which we live. But at the same time, our ultimate allegiance is to God and his kingdom. Jesus' statement, give to God the things that are God, reminds us that while we may fulfill our earthly duties, our primary focus should always be, always be on the, our relationship with God and our commitment to his kingdom and his purposes. You know, the coinage of God's kingdom is different than that of Caesar's. Caesar had a denarius, but ours is not measured in money or political power. Our coinage is love and justice and mercy and faithfulness. As Christians, we are called to be salt and light in the world, shining God's light in the darkness and working for the advancement of the kingdom. This means that while we comply with earthly laws, we also engage in practices that reflect our heavenly values. We speak out against injustice, care for the marginalized, we protect the innocent, we live lives that honor God. Now, living as citizens of two kingdoms is not always easy. There are times when our earthly obligations may conflict with our heavenly values. History provides several poignant examples where believers chose to prioritize their heavenly obligations over compliance with government laws. Here in the United States, one notable example is the abolition of slavery. Many Christian pastors and their churches, their congregations, were deeply involved in the fight against slavery. The Underground Railroad, which inclu included numerous churches serving as sanctuaries, and it was a direct violation of the laws that were, that were in effect at the time. However, these Christians were driven by higher God-given moral convictions to honor the dignity and the freedom of every person who bears the image of God. Similarly, the pro-life movement in the United States has been largely driven by Christian organizations, denominations, and individuals who advocate for the protection of unborn life. Now, their actions are often challenging laws and policies that actually behave contrary to their faith. Their actions, ranging from public demonstrations to legal challenges, reflect a commitment to God's commandment over government regulations. Now, most recently, and this is one that we lived through, is during the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, churches faced orders from local and state governments to close their doors to prevent the spread of the virus. Now, despite these mandates, there were a number of churches, praise the Lord, that chose to remain open, citing their, not only their First Amendment rights, but their belief in the higher law of the kingdom of God. Some pastors were jailed, and some churches were fined, and all was in an effort to uphold what they perceived as a divine mandate to gather to worship. Now, these examples I just cited are, serve as reminders of the importance of discernment and the courage to act according to one's convictions, even when such actions lead to conflict with worldly authorities. In our passage today, Jesus masterfully navigates a trap set by his opponents, asking about taxes, using their question to teach a profound lesson about our responsibilities and legitimacy, the limited legitimacy of our earthly authorities. And at the same time, he affirmed that our ultimate allegiance belongs to God. As Christians, we live in two kingdoms. My friends, remember that we have obligations to both, but our true citizenship is in heaven. This means living in a way that rejects the val or reflects the values of God's kingdoms, justice, mercy, love, and faithfulness, and sometimes reject the values of society. You know, we navigate the challenges of living in a world that often operates according 
two completely different values than those that are taught to us in the Bible. May we, like Jesus, navigate these challenges with wisdom, with grace, and a steadfast commitment to God's purposes. Amen? Let's go ahead and pray. So, Father God, we want to thank you for this opportunity to talk about... Thank you for joining us on Prophecy Countdown with Pastor Ken Baer. Don't leave without first sharing the latest episode with your friends. Be sure to join us again for the latest updates on Prophecy Countdown.